Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am delighted to be joined by Melissa Biko. Melissa is uh, wears many hats, but one of the big hats that she wears is leading staff professional development. Uh, so Melissa, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself, tell us more about all the different hats you wear, and can you also tell us one interesting fact about yourself? Okay, um, so my name is Melissa, as Ross said. I, uh, I work at the British School Rio de Janeiro, and I've been here for just over six years now. So my primary responsibility at the moment is to support staff with teaching and learning. So I work with about 150 teachers and assistant teachers across two sites in the city. Um, I'm involved in whole school projects as well. So I support staff with wellbeing initiatives, um, organising education conferences, um, I run an assistant teacher programme that supports and trains assistant teachers to become classroom teachers at TBS. Um, they're just a few of the things that I'm doing at the moment. Now, uh, can I, uh, what, what inspired you to leave the UK system, I suppose? So I know you're still operating within the UK curriculum, but uh, what, uh, just a change of scene, was it? Yeah, I think I just got a little bit fed up of the long hours. And I, from what I understand from friends in the UK, I think nothing's really changed. Um, I just wanted a change of scenery. I just wanted to try something new. just wanted a bit of an adventure, really. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, if I go out into the big wide world and I'm not happy, I can just always come back home. But yeah. everything's going all right so far. <laughs> there you go. So uh, for context, listeners, uh, Melissa and I, have, uh, it's probably just before the pandemic or just as it started March 2020 ish we started to do some work together uh, and we've been involved in a number of your conferences and we're going to talk about some of the work that we've done uh, but just to kind of just to, to get a little know a little bit about you um, a bit more in fact I don't know if you did say one interesting fact about yourself so I'm going to bring that back to you but um, could you tell everyone oh, well let's let's start with this question uh, tell us about your educational background and then give us an interesting fact Okay, so educational background. I'm from working class family, um, went to local secondary school, local primary school, both amazing. Um, I would say that I was quite a hard working child. I'm from a Ghanaian family and therefore there was no other choice but to be quite studious. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, performed quite well at school, really enjoyed school. I think my only um, the only subject that was really bad it was um, science. You know, science was like the thorn in my side, but luckily passed that um, GCSE. Um, went on to college, university, studied for PGCE, um, yeah. but there was a bit of a gap in between that. Um, and what's your subject specialism? Not science. Uh, <laughs> it's not science. Um, I never will be. Um, I would say languages. So I studied languages. languages. Um, university that was my focus for my PGC as well um, and after my degree I went out to um, live in Spain for a little while um, mm. in terms of my interesting fact um, not many people know that I've been on a game show yeah oh can we ask what which show it was <laughs> family it was fortunes <laughs> it, it was called dirty money I'll be surprised oh, if all right anybody else remembers it but yeah Oh, okay. I'll have a look. Uh, uh, so what, where, so you did Spain. Did you go off to teach in Spain? Well, basically after my degree, I didn't want to get a proper job. So I thought, well, what right. can I do that stops me going out <laughs> into the real world? And so I thought um, I'd contact the British Council because they were running a pilot scheme to try and support primary schools with learning English. And so mm -hmm. I decided that that would be a good way to keep up with my Spanish and also avoid getting a proper job. So when did you get the proper job? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I came back, probably about a year after university, um, and I actually went into marketing. I didn't go straight into teaching. Okay. I worked there for about two years until I became a little bit um, disillusioned with the world. Restless, the world. and it was calling you back, wasn't it? <laughs> exactly, yeah. My heart so, uh, could you give us a snapshot of your teaching career in England before you went to Brazil? Mm -hmm. So um, my NQT school was a one form entry school in central London, um, very high achieving, um, really, really good school, very, very hard school to start as an NQT, but I think it kind of moulded me into the effective practitioner that I think I am. Um, not many behavioural issues, so after a while, you know, it's great that I was perfecting some skills, but I thought, you know, 
I need a little bit of a challenge. In fact, mm-hmm. actually, one of the things that persuaded me to leave the school was watching the series The Wire. I don't know if you've ever watched The Wire. Yeah. Or anyone watching has ever seen it. But I watched the series about education and I thought, I actually sat on the sofa in tears and thought, I need to go to a school like the one that I went to school in, you know, with yeah. children who don't have many chances, you know. And so I think I'm a good so teacher. there you go. Myself into that kind of environment. So I did. Great. So, um... You know, if I rewind to when we first connected, you know, the start of the pandemic, at least for people here in the UK, the press on not just the UK and the vaccines and all the issues that we've had, but also Brazil. Um, yeah. How, uh, you know, I, I know we're still in the thick of it, but you know, the last eighteen months, how has it been for you in in Rio uh, in an educational context with staff at your school? I think it's been quite difficult. I, it we've kind of come into a sense of normality now where you know we're back in school but last year like everyone we were just thrown into a situation that you know we didn't know what was coming next um we never really had a lockdown here so we had a lockdown in the sense of we went into remote learning quite early Mm -hmm. on so it was um, mid-march and Mm -hmm. stayed teaching and learning remotely until october but in terms of the city itself nothing we didn't have a full lockdown um, but we went through a lot of the things that everyone, educators, went around, through around the world in terms of how do we actually, you know, navigate this world of teaching and learning online. We had the skill, we had the technology, because we were used to using it, you know, way before the pandemic. But how do we actually, how do we use it when we can, when we can only rely on this technology? How do we um, navigate and balance that with our own well-being as well? And that's, mm-hmm. you know, that's one of the takeaways, you know, not that we've finished, you know. Yeah, and like, for context, the academic year starts in January, is it, in Brazil? It's in February, so it's February, February to December, yeah, yeah. So we spent pretty much the whole of the academic year last year in remote teaching and learning. So, and, um, yeah. and yeah. before we came online, you mentioned that staff have just had the vaccines, all staff in the school. How long was that ago? So we had, everyone had the first vaccine i think it started maybe in may time i would say obviously in order of age but when it got maybe july time june time i think it was everyone all educators who hadn't seen so people that were kind of 40-ish and and have it on the same day and actually i think that was quite and i really loved the initiative because there was anyone who worked in education so cleaners Mm -hmm. head teachers assistant teachers everyone and now we've I don't say that again, it's probably mm-hmm. starting with, we're on the kind of 60-year-old uh, people. And I guess a final question, could you describe the kind of school environment, or assemblies happening, or staff teaching behind the line still, masks on, masks on corridors, what, what does it look like? Uh, there was, the protocols are still in place, so we have children um, all wearing masks, um, teachers, assistant teachers, everybody wearing masks. We have, depending on the um, room size, we have some classes that are split in two, and so we have mm-hmm. a group A, a group B, and teachers are teaching to both groups using um, computer, using cameras. Um, some classes are big enough where they can have the whole group together. Um, we have marks on the floor to show us, you know, should we be on the left or the right hand side. We have perfect screens in the lunch halls, um, mm-hmm. you know, and only a few people can sit on each table. So it's yeah, it's, that, it's a full sense of normality, but it's, it's what we have to do at the moment. Yeah, and, and I, I guess, you no know, 18 months of working in this way, or at least you were remotely to begin with, um, I, I guess the question is that normality, people taking it seriously, people starting to adapt yeah. and teach in certain ways? Yeah, I think it, it, is a, it is a sense of, it's normal for us. It's what we've known since we came back to school in October. Mm-hmm. It makes me a little bit sad as well, because you just think, Brazil, Brazilian culture is very warm, you know, and that's something that I appreciate coming from, you know, the culture that I do in terms of my Ghanaian background. There's lots of hugging, embracing, um, and you can't really do that. You know, some people do sneakily, you know, (laughs) but officially you can't really do that. And that makes me quite sad, you know, but it will pass at some point, you know. Uh, well, that, that's it's it's interesting to know how you you're dealing with it. Um, 
I, I guess just switching the, the topic, I, I want to ask why CPD? What, what, why, why is it your role? Is it your passion? I'm assuming it is. Um, tell me more about how you got into this position. Well, firstly, it is my passion. I'm a bit of a CPD geek. And I think anyone that works with me day to day knows that I will happily talk about CPD all day, every day, outside of school as well. Um, so why did I get into it? Um, well, I came to a bit of a crossroads, really. I think it was mid-2019. My contract was up for renewal and I thought, well, I could carry on. I really like being a classroom teacher here, but I feel like I need an, a bit of a challenge. Um, and this opportunity came up. And as soon as I started the school and I found out that there was this role and this budget dedicated to CPD, I remember saying to a friend, you know, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I've never worked in a school where 10% of the budget is devoted to CPD. That you've got actually... What a luxury, yeah. I know, I know, it doesn't happen in the UK. No, that's a big budget, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, huge budget. And we use it well. (laughs) And I remember saying to her, I would love to have that role, you know, when I first joined in 2015. And so when the job came up, I thought, you know, can I do it? Yeah, I think I could. Um, do I want to do it? I think it would be a challenge. So, you know, why not? I'm going to go for it. And, you know, I kind of think I, when I went for it, when I applied for it, I thought I want to put my money where my mouth is because, you know, as teachers, we sit through insects and some of them are great, some of them not so. And I thought, well, I know what I think is good CPD. So let me build upon what the school has already started and is doing well, and let me think about how I can adapt it and make it even Mm. better. I would say that when I started, I was using just my own knowledge, and then I saw... Yes, well, I was just going to ask. Yeah, Yeah, I was just going to ask, because, you know, my life as a CPD leader, you you have your own passions, you have your own excitement, but other people not so excited about what you're excited in. And then you find a lot of things that challenge you and provoke you that take you out of your own bias. And then, you know, I'm a secondary specialist, you're a primary specialist, so you've got to suddenly think, right, well, these techniques don't work in this context. And then you have to start to gather more information to then offer a better service to others. So I guess in your context where you're supporting a good couple of hundred staff across two or three sites, um, how are you dealing with that challenge as the CPD lead? Do you know, I think me, I would spend half of my time in one site and the other half in, in the other site. And, you know, traveling between the two takes about an hour to get from one site to another. But I mm-hmm. love working, you know, I get a lot of energy from working with people and I love mm-hmm. interacting with people. And so I wouldn't change actually having the, the broad scope that I do. And I also learn a lot, you know, I'm working with colleagues who've been at the school or have been teaching longer than I've been alive. And so... I'm not dismissive of their knowledge and experience, um, mm-hmm. so I gain a lot, a lot from them. Yeah, it can be a bit tiring sometimes, you know, when you're stuck in traffic. But actually, you know, working with all of those people, I, I get a lot from it as much as hopefully I give something back as well. And I think one of the few benefits of the pandemic is the fact that we have this technology now to bring us together. So prior to the pandemic, we were quite distinct. Um, in terms of, you know, one site would have inset on one day, another site on another. Now we just use Zoom or Google Meet to just bring everyone together to mm-hmm. deliver that training. Um, and so that's definitely something that I've seen in terms of improving the way to connect with people. Uh, and, and give us a flavour of the types of things that you're doing. So people going off on courses, you know, online events, teach meets, weekly CPD. What's kind of the rhythm of, of your professional development school? Well, I think there were some some standard events. So we have our weekly insets, which um, now I'm trying to make um, as tailored as possible. So there's no blanket inset. We usually have four things running at um, one time. So something mm-hmm. for early years, something for you know assistant teachers and so on. We also have a biennial conference, which you were part of this year. I was, um, thank you very much. You're welcome. It was, it was three, three, four days, wasn't it? It was three days, yeah, three days all online for the first time. Yeah. Um, but the feedback was really positive. That was definitely. I was gutted because I was dying. I was I was hoping to come out physically, but maybe in the future. But yeah, I know it's yeah. a it's a great great event that you do, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed working with your colleagues. Um, for me, uh, for my CPD, it was great to learn from people working in a different context. Yeah. And there was a bunch uh, to work with, so we will get you out. So how, how, do, how does this, uh, we've done some work on appraisal, which we'll talk about shortly, but how does, the, 
How does the CPD kind of tie together? You know, what, what uh, that warp and weft, I suppose you've got appraisal, you've got school priorities, you've got individual line management meetings. How do you bring it all together with so many people? Well, I think the primary leadership team helps me and supports me with that. So we have our strategic goals, which kind of helps me to define well, what what's our priority for this academic year. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I really strip it down to half of the year. Um, who, which year group or which phase do we need to focus on and what does that look like in, in practice? Um, and so I talk a lot, as you can imagine, um, and I communicate a lot with the team because I just think I need to make sure that what I'm planning reflects the direction that we're going in as a school, but also you know, reflects the needs of your team because I work with you know, over 150 people. I don't know mm-hmm. all of them individually and all of their needs the coordinators and leaders of sections do. So they've been really helpful in kind of putting me in the right direction, also Mm -hmm. critiquing some of my plans, helping me to refine some of my plans, and also just being open to some of my ideas, which are, you know, maybe things that they haven't done before. (laughs) I was going to say, I was waiting for you to define those ideas, off the wall ideas, or just, I was was thinking, you know, critique, how you've articulated how you seek feedback and critique. What are the things that you do consciously to move outside your own preferences to ensure that you give a good coverage for everyone that you, you know, one of the struggles I had leading uh, even just one school with 250 staff and 150 of those were support staff is knowing everybody's names, knowing something that's going on in their personal lives and then something they need professionally and then trying to tie all that together. It was a, it was a great rewarding job, but it was hard work. Uh, how, how do you deal with those challenges and how do you work outside of your own preferences? What do you consciously do? Well, I think one of the things that helped me was um, a course that I did this academic year. So um, not long before I started this role, the pandemic started. And so it was kind of survival mode. You know, how do I support teachers to survive? And then I took a step back when we got into a rhythm and thought, well, actually, you know, I know what I think works. I know what I think is effective based on my experience, but I want to kind of take a step back and actually think about the theory behind effective CPD as well. And mm-hmm. so I did um, I did a CPD leadership course with the Teacher Development Trust, which was amazing. Yeah, and it they're very me good. Really, really good. And it helped me to understand, well, what is effective CPD? And also, how do I... Um, assess what has been effective and so I now say to my colleagues that I'm the queen of a Google survey because that's the only way that I can reach people en masse and say you know be honest what have you taken away from this what do I need to do what do I need to adapt what Mm -hmm. further support do I need to provide you um and getting that you know staff are quite good I never get 100% response yeah and do you do that survey anonymously well not so much no so <laughs> i think one thing I, I've learned when i tried all those different methods the anonymous one gave you the information you really needed to know yeah and to be honest the next one i'm planning to do one on the inset that i program that i recently devised and adapted and that will be completely anonymous because i want yeah. to know because I, I, you know when you get to a place where staff just complain complain about the food um, then you know that you're winning. <laughs> well, I have to say, staff are still quite honest. We've got some, you know, really brutal members of the staff who doesn't matter if their email is attached to that that response. They will still tell me the truth, which is quite good. Well, that's good. I really that. yeah. yeah, that's good that you've got those open channels. Um, so tell us about the work that you've done with appraisal, because I know I've had a little part to play in this. Um, give give uh, our our listeners a little insight into what you're going to do differently. Well, I think at the moment we've got a we've got a system that is that functions and it functions well to a degree depending on what your definition of success is. You know, we have um, appraisal meetings twice a year. We have um, observations. We have learning walks, and they're fine and they give information that I think the school needs to know from a quality assurance point of view. But I think what I want to do now is focus on creating a culture of CPD. And that's where the appraisal comes in as in as and is fundamental in helping me to achieve it. So what I want to do is actually separate the appraisal process into processes that the school needs for quality assurance, but then having the majority of it um, focused on improving teachers and helping them to take ownership. 
So small changes, things like, you know, making sure that observations are focused on the target or the goal. So I'm not going to use the word target anymore. The mm -hmm. goal that the teacher is working on and not just having that blanket list of things that you're going to be, um, you know, that you want to see happening in the classroom. Um, having monthly check-in meetings with, um, with teams of teachers to make sure that you as a leader are finding out, you know, what's your, what is your goal? How's it going? What further support do you need? Mm -hmm. Rather than just kind of revisiting that goal, you know, mid-year and then not again until mm -hmm. you have that, you know, review at the next, beginning for the next My favourite thing with observations at the moment is uh, folk, uh, zooming in on one thing. Uh, and yeah. using that word one thing only. Um, could you tell us exactly, so what, what's the new method that you're introducing? Well, I think the new method is going to be the fact it's going to tie into our INSET programme. So I'm revolutionising our INSET programme so that it's all f focused on a teacher's goal. So at the moment, I think, you know, the, the INSET that I designed at the beginning of this academic year was okay, but I could see many things that were wrong with it. This half term is better, but what I would still say is that there were lots of different areas of foci. Um, mm -hmm. And as we know, effective CPD, one of the components is having sustained um, focus. And so next year, our focus is going to be on language development. And we have language development as our overarching strategic goal. And so that's what I want our teachers to focus on. So using data, the knowledge of their class to say, okay, this is a need for my particular class and this is what I'm going to focus on. And these are the strategies that I'm going to implement to be able to try and make that positive change. And obviously part of effective CPD means that there needs to be some expert input. And so again, we have the luxury of being able to invite in experts and we have a three day inset at the beginning of the next academic year. So we'll have a group of EL specialists who are going to come in, work with each phase to support them with strategies that are appropriate for their phase to then help them to come up with an action plan that will feed into their inset focus. Mm -hmm. So it's all kind of trying to bring everything together and make it more meaningful as opposed to having lots of different goals. Yeah, big jigsaw um, puzzle, isn't it? Bringing yeah. it together at the right time. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the appraisal, uh, still two meetings a week, all, all those traditional mechanisms happen alongside, uh, you know, staff setting their own targets. Yeah, I think what I want it to be is a po when I, I met with the working party. So as I've, I've said to you before, that everything that I do, I want it to be evidence informed. So I sent a CPD evaluation survey to staff, got some really interesting comments back. I've been liaising with um, a working party to get their feedback on what needs to change. And so anything that I'm actually suggesting is based on the results and, and the feedback from staff. Mm -hmm. And so um, one thing that came through the working party was we don't want to just have a meeting at the beginning of the year and, uh, and midway through the year. We want to have that ongoing dialogue. Um, and sure. I was reading a book by... Um, a Colkit, Anthony Colkit, about performance management, and that's right. one of its um, the the fundamentals of its success is having that regular dialogue. So we need to make sure that we're building that in and not just ticking a box by saying, "Oh, we've had a conversation with you in March, and we've mm -hmm. had another conversation with you in August." Box ticks. That's it. No. Box ticks. Now you had a bit of nervous laughter earlier when you mentioned the word feedback from staff. Can I unpick some of that critique that you received? Yeah. Um, uh, I think, you know, there was, there was lots of positives, lovely, but I kind of, I work on the positive, but I like to focus on, um, you know, constructive feedback as well. And one particular member of staff, she's, be she's brutal face to face. And so yeah. I knew that she'd have no problem doing this um, uh, by Google oh. as well. And she <laughs> said that and basically, you know, the inset that I had designed in the first half of the, half of the year was kind of labelled as action research. And she was yeah. like, it was not in research at all. We weren't able, it wasn't personalised. Um, what did she say? There was no... Yeah, well, I guess these, com these comments are a good fuel for you for you to make yeah. sure that you meet everyone's needs. So, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah it's, I, it's, 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 her, but I didn't want to make her feel awkward, although I don't think she would have done, by saying, you know, that was a really good point. But I, but I took it on board and it helped me to redesign the second half of the year. Yeah. So. Now, there you go. Now, um... Uh, let, let's switch uh, our topic again. We'll, uh, talk, let's talk a little bit about racism uh, and some of the work that you've done. Uh, let, can I start off with the first question? Have you ever had 
a role model of someone in your position, a, a, a black female CPD leader? Have you had anyone to work <laughs> alongside to be aspiring to? So I guess on that note, what, what would you hope from people listening to this podcast, people watching the video of, of our conversation, Melissa? Um, what, what are your thoughts? I think, you know, I, I was very, I'm very privileged in the fact that I grew up and I went to a school that was very diverse. So I, you know, and this was in the 80s, I had, um, I saw black teachers, male and female. Um, in my classroom, I had, you know, children from all across the globe. And I assume that that's what it was like in every classroom. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the further in education I got, the, the, the less I saw people that, you know, looked like me. Moving into teaching, same, you know, I don't think, I think I've worked in, I think my second school, there were a couple of black teachers, but, but not really at all. Um, mm. In my current school, there are a few black teachers, but again, not many. And, you know, we had an inspection recently and we were talking, you know, when we were going through the feedback, we were saying, you know, if you don't see it, how can you be it? Mm -hmm. um, and yes, we've got quite a homogeneous school community. You know, there are, it's not very diverse at all. It's, you know, 90 percent you know Brazilian and mostly mm -hmm. white Brazilian but I think we still need to make sure that they are seeing people in a position you know of, of, of leadership that maybe looks different to what they imagine we've got a lot of people here and um, a lot of black people who are in um, in roles for example you know uh, nannies and uh, maids cleaners that are black. And so mm -hmm. we don't want children to just think that, you know, black people or people of color can are automatically going to be aligned to those roles. We want them to see actually we can be in positions of leadership. So I think what I would like is that, you know, if there are leaders listening, people who are in charge of recruitment, is for you to be a bit more intentional. And maybe you are, so I'm not gonna say this is a- Yeah, uh, how is your, can I ask the diversity question of your leadership team in Brazil? Is it a diverse or, or is there work to be done? There's work to be done. And this is something that I'm very vocal about. You know, I don't shy away from saying this to, you know, all of my colleagues that we need mm -hmm. to be intentional. Now, I don't believe that you should just choose a person of color for you know, sake, sake. You yeah, of course. The yeah. The job. yeah, I'm reminded yeah. of um, the leadership teams I've worked on, and you know, going back, gosh, 2005 or something like that. And you know, my my diversity radar uh, is much stronger than it was 15 years ago. But um, you know, recently, sometimes being around a group of just white uh, females and males having to ask the question on behalf of maybe everybody or people outside the room, where is the diversity across this table? And I think it's important as a man, uh, as a white man to be asking those questions also, uh, rather than uh, tucking it uh, uh, under the carpet. Um, can you... It's uncomfortable as well. It's uncomfortable, I can imagine, to ask those questions as a white man. Um, and it's also uncomfortable for me as a black woman to constantly be the one to bring up this, you know, to make that comment, to make that suggestion. And I will continue to do it. But I think it's helpful mm -hmm. if, you know, everyone, if everyone. Yeah, and I, I, to be honest, the last uh, probably five plus years, maybe a bit more now, I'm becoming much more confident talking about uh, race and diversity. I still don't know all the conversations and questions to ask, but the more people I talk to, the yeah. the, the the greater my knowledge and wisdom becomes, I suppose. And I know I've still got a lot of work to do, but um, could you just tell us some of the work that you've been doing, your side, in terms of maybe developing that within your school? Yeah, I would say the our journey for um, training in this area began, I think it was almost a year ago. Yeah, it was a year ago now. Um, and it really... The, the conversation started not long after George Floyd's murder mm -hmm. um, because staff were, well, I'll talk about staff and I'll also talk about my response as well. Staff were talking amongst themselves in terms of well, what do we do, what, you know, how, how do we actually contribute to the, to the solution? You know, what can, where do we go with this? From mm -hmm. a personal point of view, I was, um, I don't know, I think it was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. And I actually remember just feeling quite, I felt quite withdrawn. And mm -hmm. I, it was a lot for me to process. 
And so the catalyst for me was an email that came from a group of um, colleagues who said, you know, we're having this conversation amongst ourselves, but we need some support. Where does the school stand? You know, the mm -hmm. school says it's neutral, it doesn't involve itself in, in politics, but this is not politics. What, what do we do to be more inclusive? We need to learn. We need to understand practical things we can do. And that was quite good for me because on that personal note, it gave me that motivation rather than feeling helpless that, you know, this is another global incident. Um, I'm going to do something about it. And this is something I can do because I'm in the role that can actually contribute to this change. And so um, my colleague and I set on a path of whole school training um, bringing in some outside expertise to lead um, two inset sessions. One was very, one was kind of information sharing. So it was kind of mm -hmm. starting from basics in terms of this is what, you know, this means, these are some key terms and this is what it looks like in case you've never experienced it or thought about it. You know, we need to make sure that we're starting with that common understanding. Um, and we brought in someone else who um, complemented that approach, but was more of a reflective um, support. So mm -hmm. helping staff to really unpick, well, what are your, what are your thoughts? What are your um, misconceptions? You know, what's your experience that actually makes you think what you think? You know, whatever, you know, race your country you are. Um, and it was, I would say, really well received. There was a lot of positive feedback. And um, obviously people that didn't appreciate the training wouldn't necessarily come up to me and share that. And I do mm -hmm. know a couple of people who through word of mouth thought, you know, had said, the training was pointless for me and um, I'm not racist, but you know, you're never gonna, you never- Yeah, it's missing the point, me. isn't it? So can, can I ask, how are you embedding this throughout the rest of the this academic year and, and moving forward? Well, um, this academic year, as you um, know, at the conference, we had a keynote that focused on um, anti-racism um, because that was part of our theme, our conference theme. We wanted to focus on, you know, what have we learned through the pandemic um, and what do we still have to learn? And race, anti-racism comes as part of that. You know, what have we learned mm -hmm. from George Floyd and what do we still need to do? Um, moving forward from that, we've had, particularly in primary, I would say, a curriculum focus. So we had some training recently thinking about how do we develop our curriculum so that we're using diverse texts, so that children are exposed to picture books or narratives that aren't, you know, aren't focusing on the same, you know, race that they're actually seeing subconsciously being exposed to lots of variety of different um, races and ethnicities. And again, it's, we want to make it, one of my key words is being authentic. I don't want to do training for sake's sake. I never want to just tick a box. And I also don't want, and I keep saying this to colleagues who are in agreement, I don't want to have, you know, the race conversation every single day. It's not mm -hmm. a case of having that PSHE lesson where we talk about, you know, race and racism. It's about actually introducing things into the curriculum that make it more inclusive. And then you're subconsciously you know, meeting that need, you're subconsciously addressing anti-racism without having that, you know, blatant conversation every day. And so I think going forward, we need to continue that curriculum focus, making it more inclusive. Mm -hmm. We've started with race and we've made a commitment to staff that we're going to evolve that and look at gender next academic year, not leaving mm -hmm. behind race, but just expanding and then moving mm -hmm. on to other areas of inclusion as well. Yeah, no, recently um, I've been doing a little kind of personal self-development on gender and looking at the official well depends on who you're asking in terms of official definitions but there's uh, 50 plus uh, most people can say female and male and that's about it and they might uh, go off into one or two others but um, it's it's astonishing how much is there for us still to learn so you know gender identity in its own rights uh, a big issue so um you know lots of work to be done i guess my final question is go, going back to those colleagues who say it's not for them how, mm. how are we how are we going to always make it um something that's at the forefront of everybody's mind challenges people's bias perceptions and and so that we keep having those difficult conversations yeah i think you know when you work with I think in total there were over 300 education staff at my school 
I'm not naive. I'm, I, you know, I don't presume that this focus is going to be for everybody. You know, the fact that we got a lot of positive feedback is great, but I'm also aware that there will be some people who aren't at a point where they're ready to hear this message. They're not ready to be reflective. And from a personal point of view, as someone mm -hmm. who has experienced racism, you know, in Brazil, in the UK, other countries I've been to as well, I was prepared for that. So I kind of put on my um, my armour in a sense so that I wouldn't be, you know, take it personally when I kind of got that kind of feedback, you know, word of mouth. The only thing that we can do is to kind of keep keep hammering on with the message, keep making sure that at regular intervals we are we are re-engaging in this conversation and we're doing something about it. I think there are more people who are interested in this area and want to be proactive in this area than not. And so mm -hmm. if only, you know, a, you know, a percentage of the school, you know, wants to carry this work on and not all, okay, I'm not going to be able to change everyone's mind. I'm not going to be able to force people to be interested, but I can make sure that I can encourage the staff who are to keep the momentum going to have mm -hmm. those conversations regularly, to support other colleagues and to be reflective, to think about what you're actually doing in the classroom. So I think my focus is on really those teachers who want to, who want to actually make a change and want some mm -hmm. support. And I think you'll know that you're winning once other colleagues start to stand beside you and, yeah. uh, you know, speak out on, on, on everyone's behalf as well. And yeah. um, so it's and a very important really topic. Yeah. yeah, there are many, many in my school, and I'm overwhelmed by the number of um, colleagues who actually are telling me about what they're doing, the practical things that they are doing to actually make a difference within their classroom. So I'm Great. really impressed. That's good to know. So um, let, let's just switch topics again slightly. Um, what's your favourite part about being a CPD leader? And for someone who's listening who might be aspiring to this type of role, um, mm. but just give us your general insights, your favourite bits, your not so favourite bits. Okay, so my favourite bits, I think at the core, I like helping people, whether it's being in the classroom, you know, with children or working with adults as I do. I like helping people to um, learn something that they didn't know before and, and that light bulb moment. And it's not just something that happens with children, you can see it with um, teachers as well. Um, I work really closely with assistant teachers. As I said, I run um, a course that helps them to become classroom teachers. And so um, through the course and the modules that I deliver, you know, the feedback that I give them in observation, I can see you know, those light bulb moments when they say, oh, I didn't realise that. And that's mm -hmm. something that makes me really um, happy. It's, it's, it's what motivates me just to make that difference and help people to improve. Um, what do I not enjoy so much? The meetings. I'm involved in a lot of meetings. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I, I counted <laughs> once in my life as a deputy head. I think I was 15, 17 hours a week in... Uh, variety of meetings just in one week it, it can be quite painful how, how, what's your target for the next academic year to make your meetings a bit smarter well i guess if you've got to attend the meetings and you're forced to be there for an hour that's a bit more of a challenge yeah i mean i as some of the meetings many of them i don't lead so i'm not sure how i'm going to make it well i'll give you a tip as a, as a, a cpd leader there is a there's something there's some mileage to be gained in stand-up meetings and walkabout meetings oh, no, yeah. Because yeah. they go smarter, they're better for people's mental health, uh, and everyone's mm -hmm. busy, and rather than being sitting down in a room for an hour, we can walk around the site, or we can stand up and have a brief discussion. Uh, you'd be surprised. So uh, maybe I'd, thre I'd thread those two into your uh, CPD agendas. Um, yeah, I think I might do. <laughs> now, one other, one other passion of mine you'll know is teacher workload. Uh, what's the issue for teachers in your context? Uh, what drives them all crazy? Is there one or two particular things? Marking, 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 which is, you know, it will be no surprise to anyone listening. I think, you know, when I, when I, when I moved into the international scene, this being my first time I'd, you know, done that as a qualified teacher, I was surprised to see how many of the issues from back home were also the same here as well. Mm -hmm. And I would say marking is something that is um, definitely takes up a lot of teachers' time. And as I said, when I work with particularly assistant teachers who are a lot of them are if not all of them qualified 
teachers in the Brazilian system, but you know, I need to learn about best practice according to you know the British curriculum. I talk to them about marking, how to be a bit more efficient. And again, the light bulb goes on, but I'm just like, well, why are you focusing? Why are you trying to mark 22 books? Why are you trying to mark whole stories? Why are we not just focusing? Like you talked mm -hmm. about the yellow box. Mm -hmm. Focus on something specific. Um, you know, think about the value of verbal feedback. Sit with a group of children and focus on them in the moment rather than thinking, you mm -hmm. know, I'm going to mark all books. So I try to give strategies to particularly assistant teachers, um, in how to alleviate the workload because it's a misconception, you know, that you need to mark everything. It everything. is, it is. But also, I mean, I'm not, again, I think one thing that they find difficult is balancing, you know, what I'm saying with also the whole school um, quality assurance, which is these are the things that I want to see when you're marking. The yes. So it's also helping other people in leadership realise. There's the still that. a lot of work to be done. Um, oh. okay. One big final question is, uh, what's the, the one thing that you'd like to see change in education? Uh, I guess, without putting words into your mouth, I suppose just think of the, the things that I've written down as we've spoken, you know, CPD, racism, appraisal, uh, role models. Uh, would it be any of those or is it something totally different? No, it would definitely be one of those. I think... Something that I would like to see happen overnight, which will not, is to see a more inclusive curriculum. I think we have um, we have things like Black History Month in the UK mm -hmm. in October, mm -hmm. February in America, and I would love for that not to be needed because I would like to have a curriculum that every single day is focusing on... Yeah, you know, I saw a hashtag uh, at the start of October, and it was, I can't remember the specifics, but it might have been Black History Month, BHM, 365 every day of the year rather than just yeah. a month. And uh, I'm a, I'd be a big fan of uh, moving towards that uh, dialogue where it is immersed in curriculum plans. Okay, uh, Melissa, we've done our formal bit. I'm going to throw loads of quick fire questions at you. Oh! I try and, uh, I'm sure you, uh, I don't know if you're uh, young enough to, or old enough to remember Timmy Mallet. I'll try and get you to pause oh, or hesitate. Oh, right, okay, yeah. but, so you're nearly of my age, I suppose. Um, so uh, let's start easy. Uh, what project's on your desk today? Uh, revamping the appraisal process. Okay, what book are you reading? I'm about to start reading The Fearless Organisation by Amy Edmonton. It was recommended by Chris Moyes. And so, uh, ah, my Chris Moyes. I love Chris. Um, on that yeah. note, I was just going to ask, actually, what's your favourite CPD moment to date? Oh, do you know, I think it has to be the work that we've done on anti-racism and racial diversity, because it was a big... I wouldn't say it was a risk. It, you know, when I shared my intention with SLT, it wasn't a question of, do you think we should do it? It was an assertion. We are going to be focusing on this. But just the response coupled with the practical, um, the practical things that happened afterwards, I think that is definitely, without doubt, my biggest CPD achievement so far. Great. Uh, finish this sentence. If I were Secretary of State, I would... I would find myself if I've not been in the classroom um, as a teacher. Fantastic. So stepping down. Okay. If we were, uh, if we had four, I'm going to I'm be generous with my time here. If we had 48 hours together in Rio, where would you take me? What would we do? What would you show me of the city? Only 48 hours for the marvellous city as it's known. Um, I would... Do a whistle stop tour of the, the famous site. So I take you to Sugarloaf, Christ the Redeemer, making sure there was a caipirinha in your hand at all times. Um, <laughs> and then I think later on in the evening, I'd probably take you to um, somewhere to watch a Hoda de Samba. So Hoda de Samba oh, right, is a great. Unique, um, musical, musical event, you know. Uh, out of 10, how would you rate your Portuguese? Oh, I'm quite hard on myself because I'm a linguist. I would say it's probably a seven, but I came okay. here not even knowing how to say thank you. So I think... Well, there you go. Uh, and you're Spanish at a ten? I'm rusty. It would be higher. I'd probably say like a, a an eight because I'm a bit rusty now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, if you weren't a teacher, what would be your dream job? Something wacky off the wall. What was it at school? Okay, if you could get paid for napping, 
then I would like to be um, a professional napper because I'm really no, good at that. No, no, I, I'll yeah. join you in that. I read a piece of research on memory about a month ago, and it said that if you have naps between six minutes to 30, 30 minutes, it boosts your memory. Uh, uh, yeah. So there's a good reason why I fell asleep in loads of leadership meetings, yeah. uh, especially after a five-period day. Um, next question, what's your biggest uh, achievement to date? Personal or um, professional? Oh, personal, I think it has to be teaching my dad how to use a smartphone uh, three years ago. And if you know, if you haven't met my dad, you would understand why that would be my biggest personal and teaching achievement. Cause it All was, right, it was great. Huge. So uh, big up to your dad out there. Uh, who would you recommend I interview next and why? Um... Okay, if, if if you want to meet, if you want to interview or speak to someone who's no longer in education, I would invite you to speak to my friend um, Venla, who is ninety years old, but it was a pioneer in terms of uh, the direction she took her school in as a head teacher. So she was one of the first head teachers in the UK to have wallless classrooms and all right, and fantastic. It, no, no, definitely. Uh, it'd be great if you can connect me with. Uh, is it Venla? Oh, well, Vendler, Koenig, you might need to okay. let some test stories and ask her not to swear, but yeah. she'd be... Now we're going to add a few swear words in. Um, could I ask, Melissa, who is your black female role model? Oh, there are so many. Um, Give us a few that come to mind. I would say quite cheesy. Um, Oprah Winfrey is one. She's someone that I studied in school a lot um, and I think paves the way in a lot of areas. Um, at the moment, I think someone who's living and who presented at the conference is Rhonda Taylor Bullock. Yeah, I think Rhonda, the work yeah. that she's doing um, in anti-racism and educating children and families as well is really inspirational. Um, I'll send you some more. I'm trying yeah, to okay. Well, that's good. I, I, I was privy to Rhonda's work when we took part in the conference. Uh, yeah. And, of course, Oprah, uh, incredible work. Um, yeah. Top piece of advice for CPD leaders? Um, to listen, I would say. Don't, don't rush in, presume that you know everything. Listen to find out. Listen and talk to people to find out what the reality is so you're not just imposing what you think um, the solution is to the problem that you feel that you've identified. Actually talk to people, listen, and don't feel you need to rush in. Good advice. Um, where can listeners find out more or connect with you, Melissa? Is it LinkedIn, Twitter? Where, where are you hanging out? Um, Instagram? I would say... It, <laughs> Um, if you want to be professional, and probably not Instagram, um, I would say LinkedIn. On Twitter, I'm on Twitter, but I'm a bit of a lurker, so I just take, I follow lots of really interesting. Yeah, there's not, things. there's no, there's nothing wrong with lurking. So on LinkedIn, yeah. yes. LinkedIn, um, I would say. All right, my final big question: uh, What would you hope to be your legacy? Um, I would hope that anyone that I've worked with, students and adults, would say that um, I listened and I cared. You know, I care about people improving and not in a blanket way. Like, I want everyone in primary to do better. I try and take the time to understand individual needs with children and adults and try to support them with their identified issue or help and help them to, you know, get that bit better. So hopefully that's what people will see. At least one. So that, I'll take one. Yeah. Person, one, person. <laughs> one. We'll, we'll, we'll settle with one. <laughs> so, there you go, folks, Melissa Biko, thank you very much. Uh, you're a busy lady, um, and thank you for all your words of wisdom. It's been a privilege to connect with you. Um, uh, for people listening at the time, it's raining in Rio, so it's not uh, the, the typical sunshine that we expect. Or has the sun come out? There's a glimmer of sun. I think you, you're a lucky <laughs> charm because the sun is starting to peer out today. Yeah. So there you go. So, uh, Melissa, thank you very much. Uh, the British School in Rio, uh, find out more online. What's the web address for the, your, your school organisation, Melissa? Oh, here we go. I should know this. Uh, so <laughs> British School, I might have to do a little quick Google. Hold on. Hold is on, it a, we are at the end? Okay, we'll, we'll add that in as well. What is it? 
Dot G12.br, I think it is. British School. All right, well, we'll add it in. But uh, British School Rio, you'll easily find it online. Melissa, thank you for your time and catch up soon. Thank you. Nice to speak with you. Bye now.